Welcome to episode 49 of the MMA Rundown Podcast, and this is the first week that we have had a UFC event canceled by the coronavirus. I'm sure there are going to be plenty more like it. Uh, as a matter of fact, we know that the next couple of weeks are also going to be just like it in that there won't be a UFC event that had otherwise been scheduled. Uh, so as far as topics to talk about here, obviously we're going to be a little bit limited with there not being any fights uh, to recap or to preview. Uh, but the first thing I'm going to get into is just talking about the coronavirus in general and a, a lot of different stories that have been surrounding it, whether it's with Dana White calling out the MMA media, uh, Sam Alvey talking about it, talking about just like general how it's affected training. Um, usually I'd probably push this back a little bit, but I, I've sort of been like holding back a lot of thoughts on this. So I think I'm probably just going to let it all out at the beginning and then just kind of move on at the end. Uh, might miss some points that I might have to get back to after the fact, but we'll see how it goes uh second topic will be ufc 249 so although a few other events have been canceled 249 has not been yet uh it, it is not going to take place in new york but they're still trying to find out a venue or figure out a venue or figure out some way to have it happen uh, so i'll talk about that uh recap the ufc events that were canceled uh talk about what's going on at welterweight there's supposed to be a fight yesterday between tyron woodley and leon edwards that likely would have led to um, the winner getting the next title shot after Jorge Masvidal with that fight not happening. It'll be interesting to see what fights are made uh, with Colby Covington sort of sticking his nose out there and getting involved in that fight as well. And then just talking about uh, the, the general effect on the jiu-jitsu community that this coronavirus has had. Uh, so to start it off, the coronavirus, um, the way I have it written down is pretty much ranted. I have a bunch of different points that I want to touch on. Um, not sure if I'm able to put this all in order and get it all out cogently, but We'll see. So I guess, uh, I, I I guess I'll start with Dana White, um, and something he said. It, it's something I'm gonna get back to, but I guess I'll I'll kind of start off and mention what he said. So he received some criticism from the MMA MMA media, not surprisingly, um, and sort of shot some criticism back at them. And obviously, a lot of people aren't terribly happy with his response. I actually tend to agree with it. Um, but the headline that you would see based on this is that he was saying that the um, the MMA media are the weakest and wimpiest people on earth. Uh, so I'm going through a story right now. Let me see if I can find a quote to read online. So it says, this is from Dana. Go online and look at some of these people. And this isn't an knock. This is just a fact. The weakest, wimpiest people on earth cover the biggest, baddest sport on earth. Uh, he said during an Instagram, Instagram live chat with Kamar Usman. What do you expect them to say? What do you think they're going to say? Uh, and then he's talking about how he has over 350 employees who work for him. Uh, no one's been laid off yet. And him pushing forward has helped them keep their jobs. Just... And again, I'm going to get to this in my own rant as well, but for the most part, yes, it is kind of annoying that MMA media largely consists of people who don't have much of a martial arts background. Uh, but in times like this, this is where it's really gotten to be about as annoying as it's ever really been for me. I, I know for Dana White, he's looking to find ways to get these events going through. He's looking to have safety, safety precautions in, case, or in place. And for... For him, it's good for the company. Obviously, if you're still running events, the company can keep moving forward and you don't have to fire anyone or lay them off, so that's good for them. Um, but a lot of these fighters as well, they enjoy what they do and they want to compete. So to have a, a guy like Dana White at the top who's trying to do everything he can in his power to keep the events going, for a lot of athletes, it's actually really assur really reassuring and really enjoyable. And so for a lot of these um, these media members who don't train, who, who really don't have that same passion for the sport um, that those who are in it really do, it, it, it tends to show where you have a lot of these MMA media members who are like just aghast at the idea of people training or people competing. Meanwhile, the people who are actually in it, the people who actually love what they're doing, they they want to. It's it's what they want to do, and they're trying to find ways ways around it. Even if um, their state government is trying to put rules in place that stop them, and this is even before then. A lot of the criticism that came was before we had all these state lockdowns. Uh, so I guess that's one story to mention. Another one to mention is with Sam Alvey. Um, so. The, uh, the headline here, and Sam Alvey got a ton of shit for it, is that Sam Alvey believes there's been a huge overreaction to the coronavirus outbreak. Before I even get into what he says, this is one of the things that just bugs the crap out of me, and it's not even necessarily an MMA thing, it's just like a general thing online, is that it feels as though people have to have like a black opinion or a white opinion, it's not as though you can have like any sort of opinion in a gray area. And as far as like how you handle something like a, a massive global pandemic, you can have one end of the spectrum, which is like you do nothing, as a matter of fact, you push people to be around each other even more, and the other end of the spectrum, you could just go way overboard and just be like, if anyone is accused of coughing, then you send them off to a gas chamber and have them killed. Like, there's there's a spectrum there where, it's like, one side is way too far, that's an overreaction to it, and one side is you're, you're clearly underreacting. Where it should be, there's definitely room for argument in terms of where that middle ground needs to be or what, what the proper response is, but the idea that there cannot be an overreaction is an absurd thought. There, there obviously can be an overreaction. There can be um, a, a way to react to this in a way that 
you're, you're doing more harm than good. So as far as what Sam Alvey said with that in mind, um, his point, uh, he's, this is him after talking about how his fight was canceled. So again, this is someone who wants to compete, who wants to train and isn't happy that his fight was canceled. Uh, he said he's very disappointed. Uh, he thought it for sure was going to happen. He's still convinced that the pandemic is going to pass in the minds of American people, which I think is his way of saying that a lot of times stories that seem like they're a huge deal in, in the American news cycle tend to fade away pretty quickly. So maybe he was thinking that that's going to be the case with the coronavirus. I think obviously with a lot of um, the measures that have been taken by the government at this point, it's not going to pass all that quickly. I'm sure when it's over, people will forget about it after a couple of weeks. Or they, I guess if you don't have a job, you're not going to forget about it after a couple of weeks. But the people who are less affected might move on and find something new to be outraged about. But this is going to be hanging around for a while. Uh, let me see what else he said. He uh, says, it's really embarrassing for me, for our country, that it hasn't already yet. Uh, but it's one of those things you can't see the future all the time. Um, he says, it's a huge overreaction. Deaths are terrible. And I'm sorry for all the families that have suffered through through that. But, but pneumonia, just a typical flu season right now, has killed close to 20,000 people. And people just don't pay attention to that. It's terrible that people are getting sick and not many people are dying. But they still are, and that's terrible. But when you compare it to any other flu season, even our current flu season, it's killing 15 to 20,000 people in a three-month span. Yeah, so effectively what it's looking like from Alvi is that... Alvi's saying, yes, well, what the damage that's being caused by the coronavirus is very bad right now. It's not good for the people who are, who are getting it. It's not good for the people who are dying. Um, but ultimately, there are a ton of deaths that happen in America. I think the stat is like there's like 3 million people who die in America every year um, with like a population of like 350, 350 million, which makes which makes sense. And he's saying if you look at the death rates from this coronavirus, e even though it's extra and above, and it's like a new category that really hasn't been there before, it's not as though like we stop society and like lock everyone inside for other things that, that cause significantly more damage. I guess one of the things you hear is talk about traffic deaths. So I think the average amount of traffic deaths in a year is like 37,000. Uh, if, if you decide, hey, look, we'd like being able to move between places pretty quickly, but there's way too many people dying, 37,000 a year. Let's make all speed limits five miles an hour. That way no one can drive fast enough to like kill someone. Is that something you would do? Or do you have to say, hey, look, we're, we're going to have to allow speed limits to go up to like 60, go up to 65, 70. Understand that there are going to be traffic deaths because of the high rate of speed that these ton machines are going at. But just say, hey, look, this is part of freedom. Like the less freedom you have, the more safety you can have. But the the more safety, oftentimes the less freedom. And we're, we're in a spot right now where things are getting shut down. If you look at a lot of different industries with this restaurant in industry, a lot of industries that are considered non-essential, uh, a lot of businesses are being taken out of business right now. A lot of people are take, being taken out of their jobs. And so there, I, I would say there's a fair question of what's, what's the, what are you willing to risk here? Like, is it will, is it worth keeping those businesses open? And maybe you have a few more deaths from coronavirus uh, that add to that 3 million total. Um, is there a reason to believe that the coronavirus is going to be so much worse than that? I've heard some projections that talk about the hundred thousands, even millions. Um, are those projections accurate enough that we're going to, are, are they based on accurate enough information that we're going to take them as gospel and shut down a bunch of businesses and crash the economy over it? Like th these are fair questions to have there. I mean, whether you come out, come out of the argument on the side of no, keep everything as is like, let the economy run or whether you come out on the side of, no, we got to sh shut people down and really slow down this virus. Like there's an argument to be had there. It's not as though you could take one side of that and say I I cannot understand at all how someone could have another opinion. There, there, there's definitely room for room for interpretation there. Uh, as far as where I'm at with it, uh, again, as I mentioned before, and I'll have to keep mentioning, I'm not a microbiologist. Now, granted, when it comes to how this is being handled, one of the tricky things about it is that you have a lot of different skill sets that need to be there. So you have to have the skill set of the people who are in the lab, uh, kind of like that microbiologist um, skill set where you're actually like, looking at the coronavirus and running tests on it, trying to find vaccines. Uh, trying to figure out how fast it how fast it duplicates, um, how it spreads. Uh, you, you have the side where you're actually like running the statistics on it. I think that's the uh, epidemiology side. Um, but then you also have to have like economists involved in terms of like, well, if we're going to shut this down and this down, what effect is that going to have? Uh, you have to look at stats in terms of any time that there's a recession or depression, uh, suicide numbers tend to come up. Uh, so what's the balance there? There are a lot of different things that need to be considered, and it feels like a lot of times we're we're only hearing from one link in that chain or one or two links in that chain, which can be kind of frustrating. Uh, so for me, again, it, it's tough for me to have a hard opinion on one way or the other. I, I definitely see a lot of the damage that's been done to the economy. I don't think it's a good thing. Um, if there are going to be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of deaths otherwise, and there's a very strong way we can prove it, then is it worth it? You know what? Maybe at that point it is. Um, 
But a problem I have is that a lot of these models that are being run are being run on death rates that are based on a, a lack of testing. So you have this lack of testing where to figure out a death rate, you're, you're taking the number of dead and the numerator on top divided by the number of total cases, denominator on the bottom. The bigger the denominator, the lower the rate uh, if the numerator stays the same. Um, as I mentioned before, I, I don't know if there are a ton of people who are dying of coronavirus that aren't being diagnosed um, for it um, a after the fact. But in terms of people who have the coronavirus but aren't being diagnosed, it seems as though there are quite a few of them. And what we're seeing with the NBA is we're seeing a lot of these NBA athletes, guys who are young, who seem to be perfectly fine, who aren't showing any symptoms, who are then showing up with it. So you're wondering, well, these guys are only getting tested because the NBA already knew that there was a problem. If everyone got tested and everyone had an accurate test, how high would that number be in the denominator? And if that number is really high, then the death rate goes down. If the death rate goes down, then all of a sudden your projections go down significantly as well. Uh, so to me, I would tend to think that some of the projections we're hearing right now in terms of the ones talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions, dead in America of it, because the death rate is so unclear right now, I, I don't know that I can trust them. I, I think they tend to be a little bit overblown. Also, it's not as though science, and, and I guess that's a very broad statement to say that science as a whole, but we've seen other forms of science where they try to run out models in terms of damage that can be caused if certain actions aren't taken specifically with climate change and if you want to go back and watch an inconvenient truth and see how accurate those were i'm not saying that climate change isn't real i'm just saying if you look at the specific um the specific projections that they had relative to what actually happened over that period of time uh, you, you would definitely say that the projections were far more far more extreme than what actually happened so the question would be uh, the, the process that we're seeing with those, is it a similar process to what they're doing running these models? And if so, if they were so inaccurate with the climate models and what could possibly happen and the damage could be caused, that could possibly be called there, caused there, uh, are we going to take it as gospel when they run it here on the coronavirus when we have so little information we don't even have an accurate death rate that we can really work off of? Uh, so I, I guess that's part of it. But to, to get into what really has been bugging me, though, like I said, a lot of journalists have been pushing this idea that it's crazy for fighters to want to train. It's crazy for promoters to actually run an event that's so um, irresponsible for, for them to run an event. Like I was mentioning last week, I, I was sort of saying day by day, or ever since the coronavirus outbreak um, really started kicking into gear in America, how things were going for me. So that was last Wednesday was when it was declared a global pandemic and the NBA shut down. Like I said last week, I, I trained on that Wednesday, trained on the Thursday after, even after all this was going on. Uh, amount of people in the gym was pretty similar to, it was, to how it was any other time. Uh, so plenty of other people still wanted to train. Uh, that Friday I was on the road, so I couldn't train. Other, although some of the other people that I went on the road with that left before I did, did train that night. Saturday I was at a tournament. As, as far as how the tournament works, there's a system called Smooth, Smooth Comp that they run for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu tournaments. Uh, and once you have people who are signed up for a tournament, they'll have like a red dot on them by their name that when the day starts. And then when they come in, they weigh in and they register when they weigh in and check in, that turns into a green dot. So green dot is they, they still showed up. Red dot is they decided not to show up or they, they didn't show up. There were definitely more red dots than usual on, at, at that Saturday tournament, but there was a lot more green dots than red dots. I would say probably like of the people who signed up, probably like 85 to 90% of the people still stayed there and competed. So even though there was, there were some people who decided, you know what, with this coronavirus outbreak, with a lot of things getting shut down, I'm not going to get involved here. There were still plenty of people who decided to show up and compete. And again, this is a situation where you have people who paid to compete, who would have gotten their money back had they chosen not to compete. And they weren't going to get paid had they won. Like, all they would get is a cheap little medal at best. And they still wanted to compete. So when you hear this talk about these UFC athletes where it's like, oh, well, the only reason why they want to fight is because they're being compelled to, because uh, they can't pay their bills otherwise. We we've definitely seen in other martial arts that people without a financial incentive in place are still going out of their way to compete because it's what they love to do. Uh, so then Sunday, I recorded the podcast. Uh, Monday, the gyms were all shut down. Uh, couldn't train. Was really bored. Wasn't feeling too good about that. Tuesday, uh, got really antsy. Decided to buy some mats. Uh, not as though I had like anyone to train with at home, but at least so I could like do some drilling at home. Uh, but I was really, really getting antsy at that point and really missing jujitsu. And it's not because I have a competition coming up. It's because it's what I love to do. I enjoy martial arts. It's part of the reason why I do this podcast. Is part of it is in a way it's kind of therapeutic to talk about what's going on but also like it, it gives me a reason to pay attention and to, to watch a lot of the sports and watch a lot of combat sports be able to break it down and when i look at it from a standpoint where i'm watching a fight and i'm gonna have to break it down later it, it sort of forces me to pay a little bit more attention to some of the technical details and when you do that you can kind of take some stuff and add it into your own game so this is something i really enjoy it's something that i enjoy watching it's something i enjoy talking about it's something i enjoy doing and with a lot of these gyms being closed it was something that i couldn't do anymore 
uh, for the for the time being, and that was really upsetting to me. So, would that be the case where you're looking at it from someone like my standpoint, and also a lot of the other fighters as well, where you enjoy doing it, you you enjoy training, you enjoy competing, and now not only is it being taken away from you, but you have people in this MMA media who are saying that like this idea that you would even want to do it is irresponsible, um, claiming that the promoter who's trying to keep the competition going so that the people who are training can actually compete, that they're doing something irresponsible, that they're doing something that isn't in the best interest of the fighters. It, it, it's just really off-putting to me, and it's not even like it's accurate either because these guys, they, they want to fight. They want to show up. They want to keep training. They don't they don't want to make a major change in their life because this coronavirus is happening right now. I mean, they'll, they'll do some small stuff, obviously. One of the things you hear about all the time is, like, well, yeah, it doesn't really kill the younger guys. Um, but if someone who's young gets it and they hang around someone older, then they can give it to someone who's at a much higher risk. The thing is that the people who are saying this, it's not like the people who want to train don't realize this either. Like, and I guess I'll get into what happened with Wednesday. So Wednesday, um, I, I guess I have to be vague about it. So I'll, I'll just put it this way. There, there are plenty of people who I've known um, from training for a while and some of them have access to mats and I've, built some friends with, with some of them and I was able to get access to, to train with some people. I'm not going to talk about where or who or any of that, but that was the case for Wednesday and Thursday. But a- after we were done training on Wednesday, like this was a, a conversation that we had and everyone was well aware, like, look, we, we know what we're doing is a little bit risky here. Um, but as a result, we're going to make sure we're not hanging around people who are at a higher risk. Um, there are some people who I train with who for their job have to be around people of higher risk and they weren't there. Like we, we all understand it. But with that being said, if you know, you're not going to be around people who are at high risk, uh, if you're not terribly concerned for yourself, which is kind of the situation I'm in, then yeah, you still want to train, you still enjoy it, and you're still going to do it. Uh, so to have these people who are sort of at the top of the MMA media trying to like push and like give p- bad PR to the UFC or bad PR to like any kind of martial art event that is trying to run and trying to give its competitors an opportunity to compete, it it, it just really strikes me strikes me poorly, and I really I, I I just have a really strong dislike for for the people who do that. I, I think typically. I, I try not to get like too emotional about this kind of stuff, but this is one of those things where uh, up until Wednesday when I was able to actually like get some get some work in, I really wasn't feeling good. Like I, I'm trying to think of how to word this. I, let, let me put it this way: I, I'm a person who has a, a a pretty big external locus of control. So it, this is a a psychological term. So internal locus, or actually no, it's internal and external. In, internal basically just means that. I feel as though what's going to happen to me for the most part is is based off of what I do, that I have control over my life. If, if things are going to go well, it's going to be because I, I went on my way to make good things happen. If bad things happen, I, I can dig my way out of it. I can make things better. Whereas the external look is con- of control is kind of like, well, what's going to happen to me is going to be based off of what outside people do. I really don't have a whole lot of control over where I go in my life. And so for me, because of the fact that I have that internal locus of control where I I, I really like to take a lot of responsibility for stuff and, and, and make sure that if good things happen, it's because of something that I did oftentimes when bad things happen to me, I really don't get all that down about it. I might be down about it for like a day or so. Like I've, I've had times where I've been laid off from work or I've been in some rough financial situations, but I'll, I'll feel sorry for myself for a little bit, but it'll be like maybe a day at most. And then after that, I'll be like, okay, well, here's what do I have to do to, to, to get this fixed? Let's go ahead and do that. With this, because there's so much uncertainty and a lot of it is from the outside, it's from the government putting in um, different bans on certain businesses being open and, really limiting what I'm legally allowed to do in terms of like training. It, it really had me down and I'm not, I'm, I'm not usually someone who stays down for that long, but I, I was feeling it Monday. I was feeling it Tuesday. And thankfully on Wednesday, I was able to kind of get in touch with the right people and be able to train again. Now, granted with this uh, new state home order in the state I'm in, which is Illinois, I don't know how this can affect the coming week. Uh, I might find myself in a similar situation that I was really last week, but it, it, it was just tough to kind of like be in that situation where I, I'm down because I really want to train and I, I'm seeing a lot of stuff around me close and you have these people who clearly don't have any love for the sport who who don't really seem to understand that other people do have the love for the sport and they don't just do it because it's their job and they're, they're just going out of their way to like rip on anyone who wants to train, rip on anyone who wants to compete, rip on anyone who wants to like offer an opportunity to compete. Like we like you can read the same articles you've read and let's face it, there, there is another thing here that bugs me too is that a lot of people who are taking really strong opinions on this it's like th- there's so much uncertainty here that even like if you're an expert, it's tough to take a really strong opinion on it because a lot of I- information is changing as it goes. Uh, but you have a lot of these people where they're reading these articles that are written by like some 
some journalism school graduate who graduated like a year ago who's in like a hundred thousand dollars of student debt doesn't know crap about biology who's writing these articles and all of a sudden they read a headline or they read a couple paragraphs and then all of a sudden they've got a really strong opinion they feel like anyone who wants to so much as touch someone else in public needs to like be sent off to a google all day. like it's just crazy like the amount of just hate that seems to be coming out of these people for anyone who's willing to facilitate people training together people competing um to the people who want to train and people who want to compete, it, is it important that you understand the risks that are involved? Absolutely. Is it important that you understand that it, even if you physically are not going to be in that much danger if you get the coronavirus, that someone around you could? Yeah, it's it's very important that you understand that. But I mean, we're we're not retards. Like we can figure this out. We're not we're not that stupid. So as long as we understand the risks that are involved, as long as we understand um, what we're going to have to do to make sure that we don't, if we do catch it, that we don't spread it to someone who's going to be in worse shape than us. Is it a problem for, for people like us to continue training, for, for fighters to continue training? I would say no. And so for for a lot of these MMA media members who who haven't trained before, who don't really have the love for the sport in the same way that the competitors do, the same way as some people like me, I'm I'm not an MMA fighter, um, at least not yet. That was supposed to be later this year, but we'll see how that works out now with everything getting pushed back. Um, it, it, it just really, it really digs at me and it kind of gets under my skin, so... That's an issue. Let me just see if there's anything else worth mentioning. Because, like I said, I had a bunch of notes on this, and I didn't know what direction exactly I was going in. Um, okay, Jared Gordon, I guess, is one thing to talk about. So Jared Gordon um, was training at Rufus Sport on Friday, I believe it was, uh, when state troopers had come in uh, and then had to like pull them out. Uh, as, uh, as far as what to mention on that, I think it's just on its own. That's an interesting story that you have a guy like Jared Gordon. He, he did have a fight coming up, but I think it was in May. Uh, but it wasn't as though it was something urgent. But even him and his training partners, they still wanted to be in there, and they were still training. Uh, up to the point where eventually, I don't, I don't know where the, the troopers got called in. I don't know. I haven't been to Rufus Sport. I've, though it's in Milwaukee and that's not terribly far away from me, I haven't actually gone there and trained. So I'm not sure exactly what their location is. I know a lot of gyms are in business parks, so they're kind of like off in the back. Uh, but you also have some other gyms that are more in like that strip mall type of location where there are a bunch of other businesses around there. Uh, so you can really tell if a parking lot's packed um, or if you, you can see through the glass windows that people are out there. Uh, so maybe that's the case with Rufus Sport. Maybe it's one of those things where they just saw that there were a bunch of cars in the lot. They're like, okay, what's going on here? Um, I would hope that no one just called the cops on them. But either way, these are guys who, even Friday of this week, without having a fight that was like, urgent where they were like in the final stages of preparation they were training because they wanted to they were training because they wanted to keep getting better they wanted to prepare and they ended up getting pulled out so i guess that's kind of another example of a, a pro mma fighter who knows the risk knows what's involved but still really enjoys it wants to keep improving wants to keep training and that's sort of the length that they're having to go to right now uh, as far as anything else because uh, i want to make sure i get this all now before i move on to the ufc 249 um Yeah, I think I've pretty much covered it all. I, I think I've kind of gotten to everything I need to here, so I guess I can move on from that for now. Uh, next topic to talk about is UFC 249, though. And it seems as though with the way that Dana White's talking right now that they're mostly concerned about getting that, keeping that main event. Uh, so if they do find another place to do it, and it's probably not going to be in the U.S., uh, but if they, if they do find a place to move it to, uh, it might just be the main event. Maybe they'll take a few fights with them as well just so they can actually have like a full card there so they're not just charging a pay-per-view for one fight. Uh, but right now, Dana White is still looking to, to find a way to make this fight happen. There has been some talk, and this has mostly been like an Ariel Hawani thing, where he's saying if they don't get this fight done in April, uh, that they're not technically like forced to rebook Ferguson versus Khabib. They might just separate the two and then decide to book Connor versus Khabib and then have Ferguson fight with someone else. I would really hope that's not what happens. I'm not dying to see a Connor Khabib rematch right away. I would like to see the Ferguson fight I, I think even if ferguson beats khabib it's not as though Connor versus khabib can't be an interesting fight and can't sell very well if you do it in the future if anything that'd probably be a, a decent fight to make you could probably do like ferguson gaethje and then you could have um khabib versus Connor as a number one contenders fight um again a lot of the interest in that Connor versus khabib fight yes the belt matters but a lot of it's the bad blood uh so belt or no belt it's gonna be interesting if khabib does win then well he's still the champion as he would be any other way as, as he would be otherwise so to me I would hate to see them take the fight away. And also, everyone wants to see Tony versus Khabib, so let's just make that happen. Now, it seems like Dana's going out of his way right now. Um, as long as the governments don't stop him, he's going to do it. Uh, he did talk about how having a limit of 10 people inside of an arena is, is not doable for him. I'm not sure exactly um, what he's calculating in terms of the 10 is. Uh, if you count the two fighters and the refs, you have three. Uh, is it by rule that the three judges also have to be in there? Uh, or could they be behind a screen somewhere else? 
I, I guess if we're going off the unified rules, they might have to be there. So I guess that pushes it to six. If you look at the corners, uh, if you're having a two-man corner instead of a three-man corner, you're already at 10. Um, I guess a Bruce Buffer have to come, has to come in, so I guess that's 11. So I guess I guess keeping under 10 could be a little bit tricky. Um, but they are looking at international options right now. I, I don't know how they're going to be able to fly everyone out because uh, they have Tony and they have Khabib, and they're both in California, and California has been pretty strict about this. They've been a, a quick mover in terms of locking people down. So we'll see if they're able to do it. I, I, I trust that Dana White's going to go out of his way to make it happen. I also trust that Khabib and Tony, like I had mentioned before, both really enjoy this. They really want to compete. Uh, they're not being forced to because they're so badly underpaid by this evil UFC like everyone's trying to make it out to be. Um, so I would hope that they get this fight going. I would hope that they get it on April 18th. But if for whatever reason they're not able to, if governments just continue to lock things down and they start issuing travel bans where they came and fly Tony and Khabib out anywhere, I would hope that they at least keep that fight together. But that's that's sort of the status that we're at right now. But it seems like day-to-day things can change in a big way on that. So we'll see where it goes from here. Uh, next thing to talk about is UFC events canceled. So obviously UFC London, which was scheduled for this weekend, was canceled. Uh, UFC Columbus, which was scheduled for the coming week, that is also canceled. And um, they had another event. I'm trying to think of which one it was. But they had another UFC event that was also canceled. That was an early April event. Uh, so it was three events that were canceled. And I think the next event after that was going to be UFC 249. So as it stands with those events being canceled, like I mentioned before, it looks like the UFC is sort of in a spot where if they could just rebook the same fights, that would be ideal for them. Uh, but it's not as though they're like, required to now. So if you have a fight like Francis Ngannou versus Eurozino Rosenstrike, if you wanted to, you could make Francis Ngannou, or you can make Rosenstrike versus Blades if you wanted to. Or you can you, you could break it up if you wanted to. Are they going to want to? I don't know about that. Um, but it, it'll be interesting to see if they just try to take the exact same fights and just move them elsewhere as the schedule starts to clear up or what they're going to do. But Either way, those those next three events aren't going to be happening right now. They're not going to happen in the UFC Apex like we thought it was, which is kind of a little disappointing. I mean, granted, we've seen the uh, Contender Series in the Apex, but seeing like an actual UFC card in the Apex I think would be pretty neat. Uh, but if that's going to happen, that's not going to happen right now, or at least not for those three events. Uh, we've also got, with that UFC London cancellation, the main event there was supposed to be Tyron Woodley versus Leon Edwards. It was supposed to be uh, effectively a number one contenders fight. Um, after Edwards was not able to come to America, though, when they were planning to rebook it for Alabama or somewhere else, uh, Colby Covington decided to pop up and say, you know what, actually, I want the Tyron Woodley fight. I'll, I'll take that Woodley fight on short notice as long as you pay me, right? And with that move, a lot of interest was then quickly built back into that Woodley versus Covington situation. Like I talked about, it's not as though the UFC is required to keep the same matchups. And it, from Tyron Woodley's perspective, it doesn't sound like he really wanted the Edwards matchup anyway. It seems like for him, the only reason he really took it was because it was a main event uh, for London. And it was a big event for for Leon Edwards, but had it not been in London, had it been in, like, Missouri, or had it been, like, in New York or something like that, I don't think Woodley versus Edwards would have been agreed upon. So it sounds like Tyron Woodley really wants to have a fight right now with Colby Covington. From a, I, I mean, from a divisional standpoint, you could argue that fight makes a little bit more sense. Uh, for one, that's definitely the most interesting matchup you can make at welterweight that isn't a title fight. Probably even more interesting than the title fights, to be honest with you. Um... Maybe Colby versus Jorge might be a little bit more more spicy right now than Colby versus Tyron, but either way, uh, you, you're not getting that fight because Jorge's going to be fighting against Kamaru Usman for the belt. So if you're the UFC, you probably want to make that fight anyway, which then sort of leaves Leon Edwards as the odd man out. Is it fair to Leon? Not really. Um, but, I mean, I wouldn't be all that surprised if Colby versus Tyron is the fight to make from there. Uh, if Colby gets the win, then he has a good case for him, for himself to find a title sh- or to earn a title shot right off of that. If Tyron wins, I mean, he was a champion for quite a while. Um, had the loss to Usman, this would be his first fight back. And if he beats Covington, especially if he beats him in a more impressive fashion than Usman did, uh, that would definitely make a good case for Tyron to have a title fight as well. So it looks like there's still going to be that number one contenders fight. It just looks like at this point, Leon Edwards might be SOL. Uh, so who would Leon Edwards fight if he doesn't get to fight against um, Kamara, if he doesn't get to fight against Moss at all, if he doesn't fight against Woodley or Covington? <sighs> I, I guess that gets a little bit trickier there. Um, I, I mean, I guess you got Wonder Boy sort of sitting there around the top. He's coming off of a pretty nice win against um, Vicente Luque, so maybe you can have Wonder Boy versus Leon if Leon wins that fight. Then he's sort of in the same position as he already was in, but I guess his winning streak's a little bit longer. He's beaten a former number one contender at that point. And maybe, depending on timing, you might be able to slot him into a title fight, depending on in- injuries to Woodley or to uh, Covington. But it looks like at this point, Leon Edwards is 
sort of the odd man out here if all things go as as what it seems is likely to happen. And would I blame the UFC for for screwing over Leon Edwards there? I mean, it, it, it's hard to say. I, I did want to see the Edwards versus uh, Woodley fight. If they do make it, I'd, I'd be perfectly fine with it. But man, that Woodley versus Covington fight was was a fight that was being built for quite a while. It's a fight that a lot of us want to see. And if they're gonna take Edwards out and put Covington in, am I gonna be all that upset at the end of the day? Probably not. Uh, but hopefully Leon Edwards does get a, a good opportunity either way if, if it is Wonder Boy, if it is someone else, where at least a, a win there doesn't drop him down any further than he already is. It gives him an opportunity to move up, uh, at least make another paycheck in the meantime, really establish himself as a top contender and put himself in a position where as long as he's healthy, he might be able to slide in for a title fight ahead of the Woodley versus Covington winner. Last thing to talk about is just a general talk about the effect on the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu community from the coronavirus. So again, this is something that I've been able to follow a little bit more closely than some other stories because it's something that's personally involved me. But in, in terms of how the Jiu-Jitsu community has been affected by the coronavirus, we have seen o- over time, and largely thanks to the UFC, that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has absolutely exploded in America, uh, exploded in popularity. We've seen gyms pop up all over the place. We've seen a lot of people who aren't even necessarily from the MMA world, or known to be from the MMA world, I would say, who are hel- helping build the sport. I, I guess Joe Rogan is from the MMA world, but He's got a lot of people into jiu-jitsu and through his podcast. I know Jocko Willink has done a lot uh, through his podcast, which is more military-focused, but he's obviously a black belt and has cornered some UFC fighters before. Uh, but we definitely see a, a lot of growing interest in, in jiu-jitsu. A lot of gyms have been popping up. But with this being a recession, with a lot of people being taken out of work, and with jiu-jitsu being as expensive as it is, it's usually if you're paying $100, or if you're paying $100 or less even a month, you're, you're getting a pretty good deal for a jiu-jitsu gym. With that being the case, a lot of people who are now out of work are going to have to back out of jiu-jitsu. I, I know the gym I train in has already lost over 15 people. Uh, as of Thursday, I'm sure that could be even higher now. So the the concern here is going to be that once everything does clear up, because a lot of the economy is being shut down, a lot of people are being taken out of work, that there's going to be concern that a lot of jiu-jitsu gyms are going to be forced to close, especially the ones that weren't exactly running with a big profit to begin with. Time will tell with that, but I think at this point... It, it, unfortunately, I feel like I, I kind of have to say it, it's going to happen that there are going to be a lot of gyms that are going to be shut down. Uh, for the gyms that do survive, uh, they're probably going to get an influx of students transferring over from other gyms, uh, which I guess for them can make up for some of the losses that they have right now. But it'll really be interesting to see, and, and I guess this affects my main gyms as well, and just really gyms in general. It'll be interesting to see uh, of the gyms that do get shut down, um, the black belts are the owners of those gyms who, who are running them. Are they going to try to reopen a gym at some point later on when they're able to sort of recoup some money and and, and save up enough again or what's going to happen at that point but to me it, it seems pretty clear that at this point um, the coronavirus is definitely going to have a really negative impact on martial arts throughout the country uh, we're going to have some gym closures uh, we're definitely going to have a lot less money in the hands of gym owners um, even the ones who remain open because they're losing a lot of students I know a lot of them are going out of their way right now as I expect them to but as I respect as well to offer other forms of value to their students. So a lot of them are putting up online technique videos. A lot of them have been filming technique videos right now in their gyms. Um, some have been working on other stuff that they can do within the gym. Some have been breaking down fights. Uh, some have been like breaking down matches of their own students just to kind of give them an extra source of value there. There have been some that have been a little bit more lazy. They've just been reposting memes online about how if you don't pay your fees right now that the gym won't be open by the time that the coronavirus thing clears up. Uh, but for those that have been trying to offer extra value, It'll be interesting to see once this is over, the ones that survive and the ones that were going out of their way to offer extra value, if they find that posting a bunch of stuff online is actually something that adds a lot of value. Maybe it changes the way that training looks after the coronavirus. Maybe there's a lot more of an online component to it in addition to just the physical part. Uh, Maybe there's a lot more of a mental component to it as well rather than people who just kind of go and uh, show up for training for a couple hours, blow off some steam, and then go home and don't really think about it anymore. So it will be interesting to see if training as a whole is affected, if there's sort of like this outside training or this home training that really starts to take a hold in addition to what happens in the gym. Uh, Because right now that's all that can really be offered by a lot of these gyms. Uh, But to me, it's really upsetting to see a lot of of good people who are losing a lot of money and possibly even losing their businesses over this. And hopefully everything ends soon. Hopefully people aren't kept out of the gym for too long and kept out of work for too long where this is going to have long-term effects. But... This is something that can happen in a recession. This is something that can that, that effectively happens when you, you decide that you, you have to shut people down and lock people inside their homes because uh, because a disease could potentially be so dangerous. So, uh, again, if they're right and the disease really is that dangerous and they're saving a ton of lives and they're saving hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives, is this worth it in the long run? I would say yes, but 
with that being said, there are obviously drawbacks to what's being done right now. Uh, a big drawback can be seen in the Jiu-Jitsu community with a lot of these memberships that are going away. Uh, a, a lot of a lot of gyms that are pretty tight on tight on money right now as it is. Um, they were either breaking even before or maybe even losing a little bit. We're, we're just hanging on long enough where they were hoping that maybe in a few months' time or maybe in a year's time that they could start to make some profit and sort of work their way back into the black. Um, it, it's tough to see them have to struggle through this, but ultimately that's something that's, something that's going to happen. Um, it'll also be interesting uh, from a competition standpoint that there are a lot of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu tournaments that are going on right now. Uh, a lot of them obviously had to stop right now, but if there's a lot of people who otherwise were training that aren't training anymore, um, where they're really having to pinch their pennies, where not only are they, are they not paying gym fees, but they're also not going to pay competition fees. You have to, you have to wonder how that's going to affect the tournaments as well. Uh, are there going to be fewer tournaments now because there is going to be enough of a demand for there to be like a tournament every week during like the peak seasons, like there are in some big markets like Chicago? Um, that remains to be seen. But a as of right now, the signs aren't all that great that um, Jiu Jitsu is going to be thriving right off the bat um, once this all ends. Uh, can it recover? I'm sure it can. And I'm, I'm sure the economy will recover in, in, in time as well. But it's going to be a little unfortunate to see the effects that are going to be had here on not just the gyms, um, but the tournaments as well. So obviously as things advance on that, if I, if I hear anything new that really changes things, I'll, I'll make sure to mention it next week. As far as what I'm going to talk about next week, uh, I feel like for the most part, I got through a lot of my points on the coronavirus thing. I, I guess if I have any comments that are sort of like counterpoints to things I'm saying or just other questions, I'll, I'll talk about that as well. I'm not sure if there's going to be a whole lot of new stuff. Uh, so it might just be a pretty short podcast I do next week. Uh, like I said last week, I was thinking about doing a midweek podcast as well. I probably would have had a, a, a more angry rant at that point because I was really looking to train, but thankfully Wednesday came around. Wednesday was when I probably was going to do the podcast, but that's when I was able to, uh, to get some training in. So not only was I not available to do the podcast, but I was also able to kind of let off some of my steam. So there, you'll probably see a little bit more emotion than normal for me in, in that uh, coronavirus rant, but it, it would have been a lot worse had I not been able to uh, to get some work in. But if the uh, stay-at-home order leads to me not being able to get any training in and I have to keep hearing people ripping on everyone else who's, who wants to train or who wants to compete, then who knows, maybe maybe I'll revisit it again. I, I, I kind of talked about it last week anyway. I kind of made some of the similar points then, uh, went into a little bit more detail this week. But I, I guess if, if things don't get better, if I'm stuck at home and I'm not able to do any kind of training and all I can really do is, like, watch John Donner do some shrimps and then try to, like, do that in front of my laptop... Um, <laughs> There, there might be another coronavirus talk, uh, coronavirus rant, but that one will probably be um, about as profane and emotional as it'll get. So hopefully that doesn't happen, but I guess that's a possibility outside of that. Um, if nothing else comes up, I guess I'll probably just do another podcast, do number 50 on schedule on next Sunday, and I'm sure some things will come up. I would imagine that UFC 240 will have some kind of update, or UFC 249 will have some kind of update at that. If there's nothing new, I've been watching a lot of past fights, so maybe I'll, I'll look at some past fights from some fighters who are coming up soon, and maybe... Uh, do some breakdowns on that and take an angle like that. But we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see what kind of news ha spreads from now on. Um, a anything new in the world of MMA. Maybe some surprising cuts. I know Maripak Tysimov just got cut, which I guess is something I probably should mention a little bit. Uh, but maybe if someone else uh, of, of no gets cut or some other big movement like that happens, maybe someone moves from UFC to Bellator, maybe that'll be worth talking about as well. But we'll see what kind of topics are available it's it's unfortunate that i really can't tell what's going to happen usually you, you know based on the schedule that something's coming up but with everyone locking down a lot of a lot of this has stopped so who knows um but before i leave quickly on my maribak tysimov uh i'm not sure what the ufc was thinking on this I, I think for them they had a lot of issues getting him to sign for fights because he wasn't able to get visas to come into america and most of the events are in america so they were fairly limited just in terms of when he was even available on their schedule. Uh, he also had some injury problems. So for them, it was one of those things where it's like it's worth keeping him around if, if you think he can be a title contender. But once he had that loss to Carlos Diego Ferreira at UFC 243, uh, I, I guess for them they were still trying to push him and find some other fights for him. But since they were having trouble, like, you know, at this point, it, it's going to take a while for you to work your way back into title contention anyway. We're having trouble booking you. Like, maybe it's better to move on so you can actually get some fights um, closer to where you live where you're not having all these issues. So from a competitive standpoint, does it make sense to cut Maribek Tosimov? No, I think he's probably top 15 level in the UFC right now. Uh, granted, he did have that loss to Carlos Diego Ferreira, which, who is top 15 as well, but that wasn't the most helpful thing for him. But with that being said, if he's not going to be available for the most part, it's probably better for him to be outside the UFC and in an organization where he can actually be active a lot more often. So while it's unfortunate that he won't be in the UFC anymore, I, I think for him in the long run, it's probably going to be better for him. Um, so I guess that I'll cover it for this week. Uh, like I mentioned, 
I'll, I'll talk about what there is to talk about next week. Uh, hopefully there is some new stuff that comes up and something interesting. I don't have to keep harping on the coronavirus and keep harping on the MMA media for their lack of understanding of how important being able to train and being able to compete is to a lot of people who do this because it's something that they enjoy, not because it's something that they're forced to against their will. And I guess I'll just leave it at that.